see. Yes, you look good. Okay. All right. Ah, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, 2021. Uh, sometimes it's useful to look back a year uh, as we uh, plan for 2022. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to review last year. Uh, so you have to sort of think back. What did what made 2021 special? Uh, well, uh, three things come to my mind. It may be different for you, but uh, weather. Uh, certainly the insects, I'm an entomologist after all, and uh, the new Thrive on Trait technology that uh, Paul and John just mentioned. So weather, uh, you know, Miracle Bag Center is really in a rain shadow and typically we don't get a, a real heavy monsoon, but boy, uh, we had over eight inches of rain last year, last summer. And there were many scenes like this where our plots and our experiments were just uh, filled with water. Uh, and it really hindered operations and hindered uh, getting crop inputs to the, to the crop. And it impacted our ability to, to sample and work with, uh, with our experiments. And it filled uh, dry washes that hadn't been filled in quite a while. Uh, it was quite a scene. And sometimes it was violent, uh, sometimes the dust and the uh, rain and wind were strong enough that we could actually damage leaves. And you can see some of the necrosis here uh, following a pretty pretty violent uh, dust up. But on the insect side of things, um, I could sort of give my personal view, but I much rather review the data that we generate each year through our cotton pest losses sessions. Uh, this, these are sessions that we do uh, that are dedicated to pest control advisors that service this industry. We bring them in once a year and they basically enter their data into a computer program or this year virtually online. And I just want to put a huge shout out to those guys that do this, uh, both for a living, what they do as PCAs, but also in giving their time and energy and, and helping us better understand the progress of um, of pest management and cotton each year. And these data are directly from uh, those sessions. So you've seen me present these sorts of data in the past. It's basically the statewide number of sprays on average that were made for our three key pests of white fly and yellow, pink form and pink, ligus and green, and then everything else um, in blue. And uh, you can see it's quite a history there. We can annotate it and show that, you know, there was a time going back 30 years uh, when we were exclusively dependent on broad spectrum inputs uh, to last year where we sprayed under two times uh, on average to control all of our arthropod pests. In between, there's been a number of innovations uh, fueled by industry, including the development of insect growth regulators for white fly control, the deployment of BT cotton, uh, the uh, availability of carbine as our first selective um, ligus control agent. Uh, some bumps in the road along the way, but then some other innovations, including uh, introduction of uh, predator-based thresholds for white fly management. And of course, most recently, the introduction of a BT cotton dedicated for the control of ligus and thrips, and that would be our Thrive on Cotton. So I like to point this out because, you know, we're really at the cusp of something here. We don't know what just yet, but, you know, there may be this false memory that in 1996, everybody in lockstep bought Bullgard cotton and planted it. In fact, we only had 11% of our upland cotton acres in Bullgard cotton in 1996, and yet we saw this huge reduction in spray complement that year. Well, it wasn't all due to the BT cotton, but BT cotton played an important role there. You can see that the sprays dedicated or targeting pink bollworm declined somewhat, uh, but it was also the white fly IGRs and a lot of practices that happened that year that made for that huge success that we saw. In contrast, based on our survey results, it looks like about 5.7% of our uh, BT cotton plantings were in Thrive On last year. So it's a minor amount of the acres. It's not been rolled out formally in a, uh, in a full launch, but I like to call it a soft launch of the technology in 2021 and, and in 2022. So uh, hard to know exactly what's impact will be, but let's examine some of the trends. Now, this is an older economic analysis we did years ago, but I just wanted to bring it up to show you that we can really gain a lot of insight from this data. And, and this data helps us understand what the proportion of economic loss was by various pest categories. Again, pink bollworm and pink and 
ligus and green and white fly and yellow and blue is everything else. And what we know is white flies are our number one quality threat and ligus ever since Bolgard has been deployed have become our number one yield threat because pink borms have shrunk to nothing. And they did so even a decade before we eradicated it. So um, these are very uh, useful data. Uh, we will update these economic analyses. These are, uh, this is an estimate of the total economic loss due to these pests pest groups um, in 2015 constant dollars. And you can see there's these peaks and valleys. And, and one of the peaks is in 1995 and everything thereafter when our losses really were reduced as a result of those innovations. And then again, after 2006, when uh, carbine became available as a selective ligus control agent. Uh, those are major innovations and it'll be interesting to see how Thrive On impacts us. But let's look at 2021 uh, and let's look at the, how the sprays are apportioned by target. Again, ligus, white fly, and then everything else. And uh, you can see uh, most of our spraying is dedicated to ligus. About two thirds of our sprays are targeting ligus and the other third is split between white flies and everything else. Um, and uh, we know that our non-thrive on BT cottons, we averaged about two sprays last year. Uh, that's remarkable for a long season crop like that. Um, that's a, a remarkable uh, posting there. But what's even more remarkable is that in 2021, that was the fewest number of sprays deployed targeting white flies in history. So ever since this species of white flies was introduced in 1990, 32 years ago, um, this was the fewest amount of sprays made. Let's look at Thrive On. Now, you recognize that we're only surveying on a minority of the acres that are out there, less than 6%, and they're not distributed in exactly the same places that all the rest of our production is. Um, so it's not always a perfectly fair comparison. It is apples and oranges right now. But nonetheless, you'll notice a couple things right away. One, we're averaging about two sprays on non-Thrive On cotton, and we're averaging less than a half a spray on Thrive On cotton. Now, is that because of the Thrive On trait? Uh, you know, I'm sure Bear would like to hear that it is, but um, I'm sure there's many factors and it has to do with the distribution of acres and pest pressures in the state and where those um, contracts, uh, where those contracted acres were. But nonetheless, uh, a lot less spraying for ligus. 24% um, of, the, of the sprays targeting ligus here and 65% there, uh, but more of the complement uh, addressing other pests. So let's look at that other pest piece a little bit more. Now, when you really analyze what these PCAs do, they're really protecting against all kinds of pests. You know, we focus on white flies and ligus because they're the major ones, but in fact, um, there are many things they have to keep tabs on and, and these wedges sort of reflect that, but they're all pretty minor. So let's just look at the two big ones. And the two big ones are thrips, where about a third roughly a third of the, of the sprays made for other pests were targeting thrips. Uh, and what you notice over here, no thrip sprays on the Thrive On cotton. So that's, that's a good outcome. But we also have questions about mite control uh, and you know, about a quarter of the other sprays that were made were against mites uh, in non-Thrive On and you know, a little bit more as a proportion of the other sprays made uh, in the Thrive On Cod. So we sometimes forget about the weather last year. As wet as it was, we forget about how dry and hot it was to begin with. And Karen mentioned it, and Randy too, we really hit a very hot start there in late May and throughout June. And those created conditions that were ideal for mite development, not only in cotton, but in, in, the, in the feeder crops of alfalfa and melons and other things. Uh, and so you see the typical bruising. This is a photograph from non-Thrive on Cotton from last year, and then a peek through a loop here to see what was happening in those mite colonies. So uh, we'll talk more about why we even are interested in mites and thrips, but let's, in order to do that, we have to sort of reintroduce the technology. Thrive on is a trait. Uh, it's, it's a genetically engineered trait. It's in the seed, uh, it's in the bag, you plant it. It's like planting any other tolerant or resistant variety. It's cornerstone to what we do in IPM. 
Uh, so its goal is to reduce the impact of pest insects. And in fact, it does that. It reduces the impact of ligus and it reduces the impact of Western flower thrips. Now, ligus are a key pest that we've already shown. It's the number one yield limiting pest. Thrips, however, you know, you saw that they were important for those other targets, but they're really um, a secondary pest and, and of relatively minor consequence in our production system as a, as a pest. But there's another part of this, and that is these Western flower strips have a split personality, okay? Uh, they are not just a pest, but they're also a predator. So as a pest, they can feed on the plant, and that certainly happens and is documented. They, they will readily feed on a plant, but given a choice, they'll actually prefer to be a meat eater. They prefer to eat um, mite eggs and white flies. So this is a species that's pretty unusual. This is the first time we've had a genetically engineered trait that is actually impacting directly a potential biological control agent. You know, surely when we were controlling pink bollworms or cotton bollworms, those are LEP pests, caterpillar pests that attack the plant and they're never beneficial. Uh, but here, you know, Western flower thrips are arguably beneficial some of the time. And why is that important? Well, they're among the first things that colonize the cotton plant at the seedling stage. And this, at the same time, spider mites are colonizing cotton. And, and you know, uh, we think of them as a secondary pest, spider mites, but they are present. And uh, if they're not paid attention to, or if we make a misstep, they, they can break out um, and cause us an expensive problem. But in fact, Western flower thrips do feed on spider mite eggs, and uh, that's well documented. And uh, it's 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 a reason why we're we're scrutinizing Thrive on technology carefully. So here's uh, you know the webbing on the underside of the leaf, and then if you look with the loop, there's this loop picture again, a little blurry, I realize, but um, uh, this is showing a mite colony that's been completely wiped out by thrips. Here, this little hot dog shaped um, image, uh, hard to make out there, but that's a thrips larva. And in fact, there are nine thrips larvae throughout this mite colony, and there are no viable mites remaining. The only mite on this entire leaf is right there. All the, all the rest of them have been removed by those Western flower thrips. Again, they much prefer to eat those than, than they would the cotton plant itself. So, um, Let's see, something's looking a little odd here. Um, but anyways, uh, Thrive On does target ligus bugs principally. Uh, thrips are kind of a second, secondary uh, target here in the West, but um, we're, we're concerned really with ligus bug control. So we ran trials a couple of years ago, and this is the control line, uh, non-Thrive On line, and I'm charting out ligus nymph days. So this is just the cumulative impact of ligus nymphs through time and it increases. Uh, we did reach threshold and we did spray on the state. Uh, and here's the th Thrive On line in orange. Same thing, cumulative, uh, much lower. And in fact, because the protocol dictated that we spray on the same threshold, we did spray there about seven days later. Um, so there was a delay in the development of the ligus in those plots and that reflects one of the ways that Thrive On works. The, the differential between the two is about 40%. There's about a 40% reduction in, in ligus nymph days. And that's by slowing the growth or perhaps killing some of the smallest nymphs, the first instar nymphs and slowing the growth of the rest of them. Uh, and the combination of those two effects really does open up uh, those ligus to other natural factors, including weather and um, and natural enemies, and probably also makes them a little bit easier to kill with insecticide. So the combination of all of those things um, lowers the impact of, of ligus in the Thrive On crop. Now that's our experiment from a couple of years ago. We, we ran a larger scale one on a commercial farm with Paco Wallerton this past year. And uh, this is now total ligus nymph days. So this is the adults and nymphs together. And we saw a 49% reduction, which actually surprised me. I, I didn't think it would be quite that high because there really aren't um, direct effects on the adults. All your, the only adult reductions we're likely to see are in the, the recruitment to the adult stage or the growth from nymphs to adults will be reduced. 
But you know, if a Ligus adult arrives in your Thrive on Cotton, it's not going to be killed directly by it. But again, the nymphs were impressive. The nymph control was at a level we've not seen before. This was pretty heavy pressure at this site um, of, of, on Paco's farm, and it was a 72% reduction in Ligus nymph days. And I think there's something else we can learn here. We reached threshold, this study never got sprayed by the way, but we reached threshold, the conventional threshold right here in the control cotton, the non-thrive on cotton. And we have, to, we have to go all the way out two more weeks at least before we reach that level of Ligus nymph days present in the thrive on. And I actually think we were probably safe till here. So I, I think in this particular situation, there would have been three weeks difference between when we needed to spray in the control cotton and when we ultimately needed to spray in the Thrive On cotton. But that experiment has not been done yet. We need to do an organized experiment on, on threshold specific to Thrive On cotton. And we're hoping to design that this year and, and test it out. Uh, this breaks it out a little further just to show you. And it also surprised me, uh, given how this Thrive On works, which is mainly in killing the smallest of nymphs and slowing the growth of the rest, I expected most of our gains to be made here in the small nymphs and stars. But in fact, we're getting considerable lowering in the large nymph fold in stars as well. And I, I presume that that's mainly because there's a um, attrition and we're not getting recruitment into the large nymph stage. So what we spray is as important as how much we spray. And I, we've distributed this guide in the past that divi divides all of our um, common cotton chemistry into three different colored categories. One in green for the selective chemistries, those that are safe to the beneficials, yellow for the partially selective that are partially safe to the beneficials, and then red for the non-selective chemistries that are more broad spectrum. Uh, we can reorganize all the data that we receive from our cotton pest losses and other sources and look at the progress through time since again, that 32 year uh, period when we were fully dependent on non-selective chemistry to where gradually we've increased, increased, increased and increased the proportion of our sprays that are fully selective. And now in the last two years, we're averaging about 85% of everything that's being sprayed, and that's just under two sprays on average, is a selective, a fully selective compound. That's a, that's a great strategy. It's, it's a winning strategy in terms of pest management for us here in Arizona. And I expect um, Thrive On is probably another step in that direction. So I would have to say insects were also remarkable this past year in another way, and that was in the number of beneficials that were out there. This is certainly not one we uh, tabulate, but uh, I have to say by the end of the season, it was almost impossible to walk rows without um, clearing, clearing the row of the webbing from these um, rather large um, garden spiders. Uh, we hadn't seen these in, in quite a few years in big numbers, uh, but they arrived uh, as well as many beneficials this year, which were at, I think, record levels in many area fields. So to just summarize, uh, we're at kind of this important time in history, another dividing line in, in technologies and their deployment. Uh, I, I Thrive On is not an equivalency to the Bullguard cottons of, uh, and, and pink bollworm control in that Thrive On is not going to eliminate every, every ligus in the field. PCAs are still gonna have to scout for it. They're gonna have to probably be even more diligent in looking at the plant and looking at the potential damage that's being caused or not caused in this case by the ligus that are there. Uh, but it is a resistant variety, which is co cornerstone to our IPM plan. And I hope and look forward to it um, improving pest management generally. Uh, I'll just conclude by thanking uh, a large group of funding agencies and others that have supported our programs over the years. I particularly wanna thank, the, the, again, the PCAs that, that are giving in their time each year. Uh, we have 